More or less everyone has considered the possibility of turning into a pirate at some point. Whether you're a child who wants to play dress up, an adult who wants to watch movies for free, or a Somali whose traditional fishing regions are now packed full of trawlers and has now realized that the new way to make money is kidnapping rich westerners. However, a cursory glance even at the history of pirates would very quickly lead you to the conclusion that piracy is, at its best, a risky game. To survive a life of theft on the sea, you need a few things on your side. A fearsome reputation so people take you seriously, a competent crew that can face up to whatever authorities might try and stop you, and luck. Bucket loads of good old-fashioned being in the right place at the right time. Let's take a look at Polycrates of Samos, a great example of ancient Greek luck. Polycrates was born on the island of Samos, a part of the ever-feuding family of Ionian Greeks. His early life is quite mysterious, all we know about him is that he was probably from a family of nobles, and that he had two brothers, Pantagnatos and Solosom, but we only know this because of the role they play in Polycrates' debut in Herodotus' narrative. The status quo of the Ionian cities was shattered in the 540s BCE. The Lydians, who had ruled with a light touch, kind of like a big brother empire, had been crushed by an unknown eastern peoples called the Persians, and their king, Croesus, had been dethroned. This put the Ionians in a difficult position. They could either go groveling to Persia and hope for the best, or they could go their own way and make a bid for independence. They had already seen the results of both. Miletus had joined the Persians early in the war, and now enjoyed nearly full autonomy while still paying occasional taxes to a king in far-off Iran. The people of Ephesus had failed to submit to Persia in time, and as a result the wealth of their city was being ruthlessly farmed by Persian tax collectors. The Samians were clearly leaning towards a sensible option of getting into bed with the Persians, but Polycrates disagreed. He did not look east to the great inland empires of Mesopotamia, which he knew Samos could never defeat on its own. Instead, he looked west, to the vulnerable wealth of Greece and the Aegean Sea. But he also knew that as a vassal of Persia, any gains he made in the west would be heavily taxed by the east. And Polycrates was a true proponent of the Greek values of Eleutheria and autonomy. He did not intend to share his city's wealth with anyone. So, motivated presumably by a combined love of his home island and a desire to get incredibly rich personally, he staged a coup. He and his brothers got in contact with Ligdamus of Naxos, the noble mercenary who had become total dictator of his island with the help of the Athenian tyrant Pisistratus. Tyrants looked out for one another, so when Polycrates told Lygdamus that he wanted to take power in Samos, Lygdamus promised to send soldiers to help him. Polycrates and his brothers used the city-wide chaos surrounding a festival of Hera to seize power on the island. And once in power, Polycrates killed his brother Antagnatus and drove his other brother, Solison, into exile. I cannot emphasize enough how much this guy hates sharing power. But not so much that he's unrealistic about it. He realizes that as the leader of a powerful but small island state, he's going to need friends to survive. Friendship with Persia was off the table for now. They were not only clearly looking to expand their influence into the Aegean at Polycrates' expense, but they were also supporting Miletus, the traditional rival of Samos. While the main Persian force was in the east, dealing with the Babylonians, Polycrates made his move against the other Ionian Greeks. He built a navy of 100 pentaconters and then took them for piracy time. When the Milesians, supported by a force sent from Lesbos, attacked Polycrates, he utterly destroyed them. Those who aren't killed are captured and used as slave labour to build the fences for the city of Samos itself. Tourists from Herodotus' day would even comment on how strenuous it must have been to build such walls whilst wearing shackles. The same slave labour might have also been used to build the Eupolinian Aqueduct, a great tunnel carved through the island that brought fresh water to the city. Not to mention the benefits it wrought for Samian irrigation, because food is important, especially when you're an island. He then went about doing some serious looting. In the 2nd century, a Macedonian writer by the name of Polyennus would document the methods of Greek tyrants employed to maintain power. He said of Polycrates, He observed that if his friends demanded back whatever of their property he had seized, he would have the opportunity of obliging them by returning it to them, and thus bind them even more closely to his cause. But if he had taken nothing from them, then he would have nothing with which to oblige them. So Polycrates had everything a good pirate needed at this point. He had a reputation so fearsome that no one dared stand in his way, after all he had killed his own brother and sneered at the great power of the king of Persia, and he'd also attacked all of his larger neighbours without fear of retribution. He had a navy powerful enough to protect him. Samos was, without doubt, the premier naval power in the Aegean at this time. And the luck, Polycrates' legendary luck. The man had never failed in any of his pirate adventures. Each time he returned home, completely against the odds, he came back even richer and more popular. Having made quite the name for himself and having pissed off the Persians, 
Polycrates invited the attention of the most powerful empire in the Near East other than the great king, Pharaoh Amasis of Egypt. Like Polycrates, Amasis was a self-made man. He'd not been born into power, but had seized it during a military coup against an incompetent king whose reign was characterized by military failures. Amasis' largest concern was now the ever-growing Persian threat to his north, so he decided to occupy the island of Cyprus to give himself a northern base with which to threaten the great king. He sends gifts of friendship to Polycrates, along with a letter congratulating him on his success. However, with the gifts came a friendly warning. Amasis wrote, Although I am glad to hear that a man who is a guest friend and an ally is prospering, I worry about your remarkable good fortune. The gods are jealous of success, and I have never heard tell of a single case of someone doing well who did not end up utterly destroyed. So he gives Polycrates some advice on how to balance out his karma, as it were. He tells him to take whatever is most precious to him in the world and throw it away, get rid of it in a manner that ensures no one can ever retrieve it, and by doing this, he'll make sure that the gods will never choose to slap him down due to a lack of tragedy and failure in his life. Polycrates took the pharaoh's advice very seriously. He thought long and hard about what was most precious to him that he could afford to throw away. Eventually, he decided on his family signet ring, made of gold and displaying a huge emerald. This was one of the few riches Polycrates owned that he had not stolen from somebody in an act of piracy. So one day he orders one of his warships to leave the Samian harbour alone. Once far out at sea, in full view of his shocked crew, Polycrates removed the famously precious heirloom and threw it into the ocean. He then ordered his crew to turn around and sail back to port, while everyone stared in amazement as their captain callously tossed his valuable jewellery into the sea. Polycrates lay back, satisfied in the belief that he had balanced his luck out. He was still feeling this satisfaction four days later, when a stranger came knocking on the palace door. The stranger was a poor Samian fisherman, and in his arms was a huge catch. The fisherman was smiling, and he said that he had caught a record-breakingly huge fish that day. Polycrates retorted that, yes, the fish was huge, and that was pretty cool, but why come to the palace with this news? The fisherman responded that he was an old man, that he had seen Samos struggle through the turmoils of the last few decades, but under Polycrates, the Samians had become rich and secure enough in their position that they were feared throughout the Aegean Sea, and he wanted the tyrant to share in his catch, out of gratitude for the good he had done the island. Polycrates hears this and is absolutely flattered by the fisherman, so much so that he invites the man into the palace to join him at his dinner table. As you probably guessed though, the great fish is cut open, and immediately Polycrates' golden emerald ring falls out. Initially, the tyrant is not fazed by this. I mean, it's wild, like, what a coincidence, right? But if anything, he interprets it as the gods endorsing his great luck and success. He's so amazed by it that the next day he pens a letter to Amasis in Egypt. He expects that the pharaoh is going to be infinitely impressed by this story. Maybe even convinced, like Polycrates, that this was a divine sign that the tyrant of Samos, pirate lord of the Aegean, was the favourite of some deity who was looking out for him. He gets a blunt response back. Pharaoh Amasis was dissolving their alliance and friendship. The letter ends with the pharaoh asking Polycrates not to take it personally, but to understand that Amasis simply did not want to mourn the loss of a close friend when disaster inevitably befell the tyrant. Polycrates was furious. The Egyptians had betrayed and abandoned him. So he switched sides. He sent an ambassador to the Persian king Cambyses, who everyone knew was preparing for his invasion of Egypt. The letter was kind of like a request for a request. Polycrates quite literally asked the Persians, to ask him formally to help against Egypt. The king of Persia promptly obliged and asked for naval support from the Samians. The trouble was, this doesn't seem to have been a wholly popular move. Abandoning the Egyptians rustled some feathers amongst the captains of the Samian navy, who had feared the consequences of their new orders to attack Egyptian shipping. When the pharaoh had opened up talks with Sparta, the most powerful Greek city on the mainland, he had sent the Greeks a gift. It was a fine breastplate, interwoven with gold and showing images of mythological creatures. The gift was then intercepted by Polycrates. Despite many of his sailors being apprehensive at best about stealing from the Spartans, Polycrates keeps the breastplate. He then decides that he ought to be rid of the captains and sailors amongst his fleet that were doubting him. He selects the ones who had spoken against his plans and sends them on the expedition to Egypt. He also sends a note to Cambyses saying that no matter how successful the campaign, he would appreciate it if none of the Samians he had sent to fight in the war ever came home. Nobody knows if the Samians ever reached Egypt. It doesn't really matter, to be honest. The important thing is that before the war was over, they deserted and returned to Samos with the intention of deposing Polycrates. They arrived by complete surprise on the horizon, and in a panic, Polycrates sails out to meet them with his navy. But this is where his legendary winning streak comes to an end. His navy is completely scattered by the returning fleet. 
The rebels, who had been victorious at sea, then land on the island, but they're promptly beaten by Polycrates' army. And so a stalemate ensues. The rebels can't land on the island without being driven back into the sea, and Polycrates cannot sail out and break the blockade. The rebels attempt to provoke a second rebellion within the city walls by sending word that they didn't want to sack or destroy the island, only remove Polycrates. Polycrates responded by locking up all of the women and children on the island in wooden sheds, with men posted 24-7 ready to set them on fire, just in case anyone was questioning their own loyalty to him. The Samians then sent an embassy to Sparta. They remembered Polycrates insulting their city, and knew that if they sold their rebellion correctly, they might encourage the Spartans to join the war. However, as the Samians are making their argument, the Spartan king quite literally turns to them and says, Sorry, I wasn't listening. Can you say it all again, please? This is to the great amusement of the Spartan assembly. But eventually they do agree to send help to the rebels. And when Polycrates sees Spartans landing on his shore, he leads a force out to attack them personally. The battle is fierce, but eventually the Spartans do get the upper hand and force Polycrates to retreat to his walls. This would have been the end for the pirate if the Spartans had chased him, but the majority of them wanted to rest and recuperate before assaulting the walls. All except for two Spartan soldiers, Archias and Lycopes. These two chased Polycrates all the way back to his city, looking to kill or capture the tyrant. Instead, the Samians waited until Archias and Lycopes had run too far from their line to be helped, and then they turned on them and killed them both. What happens next is really interesting. Polycrates ordered that the two Spartans who charged after him alone were given a public funeral, with all honours, as if they were Samian heroes who had died on his side. Archias, one of the Spartans who had died hundreds of miles from his home in Samos, left behind him a pregnant wife in Sparta. When she gave birth to a son, she named him Samius, as a show of respect to the people of the island on which his father had died. The son of Samius, grandson of Archias, also confusingly called Archias, actually met Herodotus and told him this story, which is how we still know about it today. He also says that even two generations later, his family honoured the Samians as a noble people, who had treated his grandfather with great respect after he fell in battle. It's just a cool little insight there into Greek attitudes towards dying in battle and respect for one's enemies. Archias and Lycopes die in vain, however. After 40 days of siege, Polycrates forms a cunning plan. He mints coins of lead, and then covers the worthless money in a thin layer of gold. He then uses this to bribe the Spartan commanders. The Spartans would forever deny this, saying that they abandoned the war because it was clearly not going to be easy or benefit them, but the story still persists that Polycrates tricked them. The rebels, who remember not long ago were pirates, abandon the siege and go back to pirating. They attack the island of Sifnos and loot it of all its riches. They then bully the people of the port town of Ermione into handing them the island of Hydria to use as a little pirate base. They then use their ill-gotten gains to steal a bit of Crete, build a town and rule over it for five years. In the sixth year of being on Crete, the Samians are attacked and beaten by the locals, who sell them all into slavery. And that's the end of their story. But yeah, I bet you thought, like Amasis said, that Polycrates would fall to his own hubris and meet his fated end. Well, no, he survives the rebellion, and those that wanted to overthrow him are now slaves on Crete. Although his great fortune was decimated by the rebellion, he was still alive, in power, and clearly lucky. He was riding high on this self-confidence when a Persian messenger came to him. He presented a request from the satrap of Sardis, historically a rival of Polycrates, but interestingly he comes bearing a request for friendship. The satrap, Oroates, was fearful that the mad king Cambyses was going to purge him. Convinced that the king wanted him gone, he requested Polycrates help him escape Persia into exile, and that as a reward, Oroates would give the Samians half of his fortune. Polycrates, who was, for the first time in years, a little bit low on cash, agreed. When Polycrates' agents arrived at the Persian court, the satrap used Polycrates' own trick on him. He had these big pirate chest-looking boxes filled with stones, and then covered the top in a layer of gold coins. By doing this, he was going to blind Polycrates with greed. You see, the Persians were not at all interested in becoming allies with this unpredictable and thoroughly self-interested pirate king. They wanted to destroy him, and take his riches and his navy. However, this plot disguised as an offer of friendship wasn't nearly as sneaky or clever as the Persians might have hoped. Polycrates' agents all smell something fishy, and not just because they all live by the sea. Even his daughter becomes convinced that her father is walking into a trap. She has a dream about Polycrates in which he's bathed by Zeus himself, before being anointed by the sun. Cryptic and prophetical dreams are never a good thing in the ancient world, and so she begs her father not to leave the island. Polycrates gets angry at this and threatens her with the Princess Fiona treatment. Only without the possibility of a Prince Charming or Ogre showing up in shining armour to rescue her, 
His daughter bluntly responds that she'd be fine remaining single and locked in a tower forever if it meant saving her father's life. Polycrates just shrugs off this warning. His daughter was young and stupid. He was the luckiest man on earth. What could possibly go wrong for him? Well, as soon as he landed on mainland Asia, everything, it turns out. He's immediately apprehended and brought to our 80s. What happened to him next is too horrible to describe. As in, literally, we don't know. Herodotus, who writes 90% of what we know about Polycrates, himself says that he died a horrible death, one which neither he nor his great plans deserved. Now, Herodotus regularly describes the executions of women and children and the likes by means such as impaling and flaying, usually after some kind of sexual abuse or castration. So it really speaks volumes that Herodotus finds whatever happened to Polycrates to be too awful to even put into words. He does, however, tell us the last thing that happened to Polycrates. After presumably days of horrific torture, he's finally crucified on the cliffs overlooking the sea that he once ruled. Whilst dying on the cross, a freak storm hits the country. The storm then clears as quickly as it came, and a bright sun scorches the landscape. Therefore, Polycrates, in his dying moments, was both washed by Zeus and anointed by the sun. Herodotus, who genuinely looks with disgust at the strongman dictator types that rose to power in 6th century Greece, recalls the story of Polycrates' death with a degree of sadness, saying that he had no equal as far as tyrants outside of Sicily go. He also describes with relish the fate of the satrap who had betrayed him. Oroates picked the wrong side in a Persian power struggle that resulted from the death of Cambyses. Because of this, the new king, Darius, would put him to death. Herodotus makes the moral of the story very clear, that no man is infinitely lucky, and that anyone who believes that they are is setting themselves up for a catastrophic fall. But I take a different moral. Crime doesn't pay. Polycrates' little Aegean Sea empire was based on little more than strength of arms and fear, and this worked for most of his rule. Eventually the world turned against him once fear of him had worn off. But that's just my take. Thanks for watching.